Well, you le you uh, guide me to stay in the area that you need, and then we can chat a little after we, that. Yeah, we can go wherever you want. I okay. want to do the veteran stuff for sure, because we'll put that on today and on Veterans Day, and then we'll go into other weird stuff. So, right. Love your voice. <laughs> You said it. You said it perfectly. It's just like how I hear it. And I usually lay in, in bed with uh, earphones on, listening to you or George Norrie or whoever. Right. Well, I've been told for years that you listen, so yeah, I absolutely. always make a point of playing a John Fogarty song or a Creedence song in the bumper music. Thank uh, you. Almost every show I, I host. So, uh, thinking, well, he's out there somewhere. Listen. Yep. Absolutely. Are you or oh, it'll, it'll come after. It it's was okay. You're the one that broke. The, the Bob Lazar yeah, stuff, right? That's yeah, that's me. It's my baby. Yep. For, for good or, or ill. Um, we're rolling, Matt? All right. John, two good things came out of Woodstock 50. Um, one was uh, your connection to Veterans Village and, mm -hmm. and your support for it. The other was this album. People forget Credence performed at the original Woodstock, but everybody was asleep. And now I just, I, got, I bought that album this, as soon as it came out. It's ter terrific performance that the world didn't get to hear. Oh, you're talking about the Woodstock yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I actually haven't listened to the whole thing all the way through. I've heard little pieces over the years. You would think I would have been motivated to now, you know, watch it or listen to it. But I don't know. We're, it's, it'll, it'll be there when it's time. You know? Yeah, it's good. It's but great. I did know that we had played our rear ends off at, you know, we played a really great set. We, were, we had something to prove. Um, and we went there with the idea of, you know, it was a big stage and, and a lot of people could see us. But unfortunately, the, beyond things I could control, the audience was mostly asleep by then. <laughs> and the, the recording kind of languished in oblivion there for a long time. Well, it's great to have it out. Um, and I, I mentioned the other good thing is you, you donated what you were paid for the, that show that didn't happen to Veterans Village here in Las Vegas. How did you make the connection? You've been involved in veterans issues for a long time. How did you make the connection to this one? Well, um, Arnold had been trying to get a message to me. Arnold Stock, the guy that uh, created Veterans Village. And I guess for a while I'd heard that there was somebody that had something to do with veterans up in Las Vegas. And finally, the, the kind of letter, really more formal than an email, but it, it got to me. I read it on my computer and the way we all do now. And I, wow, who is this guy? This is, he, he just was so eloquent and he said everything the right way and you could get a picture and uh, your heart just was touched, you know. I, I talked to Julie, my wife, and said, we got to get in touch with this guy. This, he's really passionate and he's the real deal. Uh, let's find out what we can do to help. And you did. And uh, I mean, they built this facility. It's, a, it's an amazing place from what mm -hmm. I understand. And on Monday, Veterans Day, there's a debut of a new concert film, and that also is going to help veterans, right? Tell me about it. Well, yeah, um, we're donating some of the proceeds. We're also uh, inviting veterans that are going to be part of the audience uh, here, certainly, and I think all across the country. And uh, I think more so the the payment that that I was supposed to receive for Woodstock 50 which never happened, um, I kind of, I was doing an interview when the day that um, it became a fact that it finally has ended, you know, Woodstock 50 is not going to happen. And I was talking to some fella on the phone, uh, press, and I said, well, you know, I'll probably dedicate my payment to char charity. I said, I come from a generation that's not used to getting paid for doing nothing. And I said, you know, maybe the vets is kind of what I said. I mean, it was just, I was just being real and talking to somebody, but as time went on, I realized that was a really good idea. So here we are. And these were the guys. Mm -hmm. um, so the film, tell me about the film. It's a, it's a concert film, Red Rock, Special Place. Well, I'm doing, currently doing a show that my wife, Julie, uh, really helped design and produce. I mean, she's, her credit is directed and uh, producer, and she created the whole thing. Um, and so, we did we we recorded that concert at red rocks we had been here in vegas i think back in perhaps may uh doing the show and then i think the first next place we played was red rocks and it was all filmed um 
And when I sat down somewhat later than that to look at it and also hear the music, I was actually blown away. It surprised me. You know, I've done a few live things over the years, and I've heard Proud Mary before, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but there was some extra thing in this, and I really can't put my finger on it other than I'm with my family. You know, my boys are up on stage, and uh, Julie, my wife, is right off stage kind of directing and all, and it, it there seems to be a sense of purpose in the whole thing, you know. And I was watching it, uh, me and Bob Clearmountain, who, he's the mixer of the music, very probably the number one guy in the world. And I, you know, I sat down and kind of, okay, let's do this, you know. And then it started, and next thing I knew it was over. And I went, wow, that just, wow. I, I kind of went along with it and enjoyed it. Um, veterans issues have been important to you for a long time. You served uh, in Army Reserve during yeah. the Vietnam era, and I know a lot of my friends, uh, I didn't go, uh, but I was, it's the only thing I won is the lottery, uh, the year they had the lottery. And yeah. uh, a lot of my friends went and came back changed. Um, yes. Your music was the soundtrack for those guys. It was a connection to um, home for a long time. Indeed, I've, I've heard from veterans a lot over the years. Um, you know, the part that the scenario people never quite realize, especially back in the protest era, uh, they'd be yelling at a group of soldiers, you know, and I'd be talking to some of my friends, going, don't you guys realize he's 19? He likes all the same stuff you like. You know, all the bands like the Beatles and all that, he wears the same clothes at home. He's just doing what Uncle Sam makes him do. He doesn't necessarily want to do it, he's, but he's doing his duty and he's not shirking from it and you know he's not the guy to be yelling at it's higher up where you ought to be aiming your protest and so i mean those soldiers those vets were all part of the culture of their times and certainly they heard my music and a lot of other rock and roll at the time too i've read uh, since then fortunate son which is a lot of people think me included might be your best song and um the misconstruing of what that song meant, that it was anti-military, when, what, 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 what song were they listening to to get that idea? Well, and I've talked to uh, many vets about this, you know, and, and I would, uh, I was even talking to a guy who was officially from a military uh, newspaper a few weeks ago, and I said, you know, I didn't want to go. I said, I, I hate to break the news to you, but, when I was a little kid, I didn't think to myself, I want to grow up and be a soldier in the jungle in Vietnam. <laughs> you know? um, I think I want to be a baseball player or hopefully a musician. And he, the fellow I was talking to answered back the same way. You know, most of the fellows that end up in military didn't start out wanting that. There are a few really brave and exceptional people who are destined for a life in the military. But most people don't want to go somewhere where uh, they're in harm's way and they're going to get shot at and maybe killed. Uh, it's just common sense. But people in civilian life think they're a bunch of, you know, Genghis Khan running around uh, trying to be soldiers. And they're really not. They're everyday people like you that somehow ended up in the military. I just think about that time period. If you were poor, as I was, chances of going were pretty good. Yep. You know, and the, if you knew somebody, you didn't go. That's what Fortunate Son is all about. And, and, and to, to, for people to miss that is amazing. It's like think, looking at Springsteen's Born, to, uh, um, Born in the USA and think it's a patriotic song. Right. Um, Las Vegas. So I, I ordered your book, uh, uh, your book. I, it's not here yet. It'll be here today. Uh, but, you know, the peaks and valleys of your life. I mean, valleys were pretty deep. Peaks are pretty high. Did you figure you would end up in the Las Vegas Strip? And is it a good fit? Um, certainly not years ago. Um, if anything, I'm sure I would have tried to avoid the strip, actually. Um, you know, there was the, the people before Elvis, even, what, we, what I would call the Rat Pack. And that was, you know, that was kind of my parents' music, you might say. That was old people's music. Um, and as far as I remember, people from that generation, a lot of whom played in Vegas, had kind of an attitude about rock and roll. They didn't think it was worthy, you know, uh, and they would, whatever, they would say stuff about it. And so I, I certainly picked that up as a kid and it was like, you know, okay, it's us against them, huh? Right? Um, but 
as I got older and kind of, well, Vegas was changing slowly, but also um, where my career was going, and I think this is the case of a lot of people, um, you find that it's not just hippies who are coming to your shows, you know? There are people from all walks of life and that obviously like all kinds of music, and um, many of them come to Las Vegas just for fun as I would do with my wife all the time, uh, and my kids even. The kids went to Circus Circus, you know, mom and dad might be doing a slot machine or something. Um, and so I, I saw the change, and in, in, as I put it, the first time I was gonna play in Las Vegas, you know, it, it's all about entertainment. Yeah. And I said to myself, I think he said it out loud actually, well, this is a worthy thing to get good at. Right? I mean, a lot, you can throw rocks at something you don't understand and that's that. But if you really take a look and realize it's got the same demands, you know, that you aspire to, you know, entertainment is entertainment. And well, that's the part I really, you know what, let's do this right. And it's, it's great for great entertainers like yourself to be able to, you don't have to travel all over the world. The world can come to you here. Uh, our residency is a convenient thing for you. Yeah, it's great. It's kind of nice to settle in and have your shoes in the same place for a few days, that kind of thing. Um, let's get talk about weird stuff for a minute. Um, you wrote, you had like seven gold albums in four years, three albums I think in one year. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Does it ever pop into your head, the song is there, uh, already uh, written for you? Only a couple have arrived pretty fully formed. Deja Vu All Over Again was a, an actual protest song I wrote much later about the uh, Iraq. Well, we weren't in Iraq yet, but we were, I'm talking about 2001. Um, and it, but I kept hearing, we all were hearing the rumblings. You know, we had retaliated against the 9-11 thing, but immediately going to Afghanistan. But some people had ulterior motives, you know, like all that oil over there. <laughs> uh, and that's when I wrote that song, uh, Deja Vu, all over again, kind of in that interim between Afghanistan and the Iraq invasion, because uh, I was against it. I, I just thought, gee, we've heard this all before. It looks like it did last time, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Um, but your very real question about where does it come from, I can't really tell you. I mean, I don't really know. And I, I am a bit mystical about all of that, but I do think it's up to me to do everything I can to be a receptacle. Um, you know, if you're too busy, if you double parked, in other words, in everything that you do, it's probably, it might knock on your door, but you'll go, eh. you know. You've gotta have, a, you've gotta have space. Like, I practice guitar every single day. I, one of my passions is I wanna get better. Still. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and I got, you know, there's a nice long way I still got to go. Um, it, it'll keep me busy, in other words. But part of that is being involved with music and having a guitar right there puts me in that receiving mode. And if something strikes, I'm right there. Another thing I started doing very early on uh, it was right after I got off of my active duty for the Army Reserve. This is back in 67. I knew. I wanted to get more organized because it was all been kind of haphazard uh, before. You know, you find a napkin and maybe a crayon. I mean, I lived at home with my mom, you know, so <laughs> I wasn't an organized songwriter yet. And I decided I, you need to get a place where you can store all this stuff. And this was very low tech in those days. I said, well, I guess I'll get a little notebook. I went and got a little binder. I mean, it was about that big and put some, uh, uh, binder paper because it was two separate purchases at the local drugstore and it said yeah I just I'll write all my song ideas it evolved into being a song title book which kind of tells you where you're going but initially I just wanted to write my ideas I got home put it on a table in a in a special place and a few days went by and the first phrase that seemed worthy you know, something crossed my mind was proud Mary that's the very first thing that happened after I made that decision to uh, start collecting. I opened my little book and wrote it in there. And this song, a bit 
mystical in that way. Uh, many months later, in the middle of 68, I got my honorable discharge from the Army. I had been actually stepping over this envelope with a seal on it at my apartment house for a few days because I didn't look close and, uh, you know, I don't know anybody in the government. <laughs> I finally looked close. It, but anyway, I was overjoyed. I opened it up and it, wow! And I did a cartwheel on the little patch of grass they had in front of the building. I went inside, started strumming on my Rickenbacker, uh, messing with some chords and finally I'm singing rolling, rolling, you know, and wow, I wonder what this is. By then I had several pages in the book, right, the songwriting book. Then I opened it up and the very first thing, wow, this is a song about a boat, a boat named Proud Mary, wow. And so the process had worked for the very first time in my life. And it was my best song, arguably. <laughs> um, a lot of themes, weird themes pop up in your work over the years. Who do? I had the zombie. It came out of the sky. Uh, yeah. Premonition. Um, you know, there are a lot of these, what would be covered on my like coast to coast, these things. Have you had some kind of experience, some kind of connection to these topics? Or just an the interest? The only thing, yeah, I've never seen a UFO that I know about, nor have I seen an alien that I knew about at the time. Um, but the thing that's curious to me, because I've heard a lot of other people on coast telling similar stories, that when I was about five, well, we moved. When I was five and a half, we moved from one house to a new house. And at the new house, before I was six, but I turned six there, uh, I immediately started having these dreams. And in the dream, basically I was flying. I was up over the neighborhood, just a little bit above the telephone poles and the trees. And I'm flying around, you know, kind of like this, I, I, but I had this dream from the time I was six until I was about 12. I had the dream over and over and over and over. And there always seemed to be a presence, like a person that I was aware of, that I knew, a, a guide, if you will. I didn't know what to call it, but it was always the same situation. And I flew around, as I said, low enough that I could look in people's windows and, hey, there's Mike, you know, stuff like that. Astral projections, kind of. I don't know what it was. So you listen to Coast? Absolutely. I, I was told your son is, is deeply into, into the subject of UFOs too, Shane. Uh, Tyler, more Tyler, so, I think. Tyler. Yeah. Um. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there may be some, uh, some uh, cause and effect to this. Uh, when Tyler was an infant, you know, I used to carry all my kids around in that papoose thing. And mom had gone off with Shane and our older daughter, uh, Lindsay, to South Bend, where she's from. And I was to join her a few days later, bringing Tyler on the airplane, a, a male uh, bringing an infant. It's an amazing thing how many women come up to you and go, do you need help with that baby? But anyway, while Julie was gone, I went down to a local theater. Now, there was a, excuse me, there was a movie I wanted to see. It was called Fire in the Sky. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I took, Tyler and my little papoose and we sat there and watched the movie when the noise kind of got started a little loud I'd have to well, I don't want to mess him up so I'd go out in the lobby and then come back you know um, and over the years I've kind of thought that that had something to do with his interest uh, you you know about this stuff you're knowledgeable Bob Lazar Area 51 Roswell you're up on it well I yeah up on it in the sense I'm a I guess you call it a fan um, I started quite young, you know, in the 50s was a great time for a kid growing up to uh, experience the, the flying saucer phenomenon and little green men from outer space and all that. I mean, there was just, there was, I saw every science fiction movie that was made and a lot of the horror ones too. I mean, I, I really just kind of lumped it all together. Frankenstein and uh, it came from outer space, 3D. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite movie from that era was Invaders from Mars. Yes. Because it kind of went away and you couldn't see it for years and years and years and years. And finally, Bob Wilkins on Channel 2 on uh, Creature Features showed it sometime in the 80s, I think. But, uh, you know, I sat there with my popcorn and, wow, it's just like I remember, you know. Well, I was asking about sources of inspiration for you, how, whether you got a connection there. I know you had an epiphany 
at the grave of, of Robert Johnson. And I just didn't know if, if, all, if that kind of experience that you had fits in with your interest in otherworldly stuff. I hadn't ever really put those two together. Huh. Um, it's quite possible. I, you know, all I know is that the, how that story played out is I, you know, the, where Robert Johnson, the famous Delta Blues musician, is, is buried is kind of lost to the ages. There are, I think, a few purported uh, grave sites. And I followed one, I don't know, it was a t detective thing, reading several books and finding out that you go to the uh, certain post office and the postmaster will, you know, I, I read this, and he'll, the postmaster will give you directions, you know, and it's about a <laughs> half hour journey from where he is to uh, Robert Johnson. But when I walked in, you know, I found the post office, I think it's Moorhead City, if I'm not mistaken, in Mississippi. But I opened the door to walk in, and he's sitting right at it, looking right at me. And the guy I'm supposed to, you know, I thought about that later. Well, how did he know I was coming? He was, just, he was like watching, you know, and I came in the door, he told me. And I went over and, and found Robert's gravesite, a little church, a black church in Mississippi, if you know how our country uh, has worked uh, historically, I'm sorry to say. But anyway, uh, and there had been a big flood, a torrential, you know, rain for the week prior, and all the place was still flooded. And there was a big tree where they told me that Robert was buried under. And by God, I'm going to touch that tree. So I had to wade in there, you know, and touch the tree, and came out. I'm standing there, and I mean, it was like 115, and really humid, and, and I'm going, wow, it sure is a hot day. And I would start to... Um, kind of reminisce about Robert who was right at that time had had his life's work released on CD. So Robert was a pop star, right? I think the album went gold if not platinum. And, and so I mean, my, it, I'm turning the wheels over in my head. Well, yeah, he's got a hit record. Wow, I wonder who owns those songs. This is how it came to me. Yeah. Because now I'm an older person and I, uh, I'm fearful about that situation for <laughs> Robert. You know, they're probably owned by some guy in a big tall building in New York City with a big cigar. And, I, you know, and it, the, the idea disgusted me because they should belong to Robert, right? And so it, once that thought of someone else, probably a shyster owning Robert's songs, I, I kind of did a sweep across the, my, my windshield. It doesn't matter, Robert. And I'm, now I'm having a conversation. It doesn't matter, Robert. <laughs> Those are your songs. And I, my eyes got real big as I said that because I famously was not performing my own songs, yes. right? <laughs> and I had made a vow because uh, there were certain things in my mind that were just sort of, it was kind of like a Gordian knot. And I had tied the knot and, you know, I'm a man of principle and it's just going to stay that way. And I had no real good device to untie the knot, you might say, right? And I'm standing there and said, doesn't matter, Robert, those are your songs. And, oh my God, John, something's like, tug John, hello, John, that's just like you. And I'm going, wow, wow, you know, I better start playing those songs before I'm laying in the ground here like Robert. I mean, that was the boost in the rear end that changed everything. That's awesome. That's a great story. I, I'm told we're out of time. I I'm can't sure. thank you enough. <laughs> I hope we get to do this again. Um, and we're so glad to have you in Las Vegas. It's just a, thank such you. a great fit. Thank you. It's great fit. to be here. Yeah.